All right, Shabbat Shalom, Mishpaha. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Welcome to Great Awakening. Shabbat teaching and service. Praise Yah. Hallelujah. Praise Yah. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Hallelujah. 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 Bless his holy name on today. I will be reading from the Sefer Bible coming from Psalms 113. And it reads, Hallelujah. Praise, O ye servants of Yahuwah. Praise the name of Yahuwah. Blessed be the name of Yahuwah from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun until the going down of the same, Yahuwah's name is to be praised. Yahuwah is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Who is like to Yahuwah Elohim who dwells on high, who humbles himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth, who raises up the poor out of the dust and lifts out the needy of the dunge hill? that he may set him with princes, even with the princes of his people. He makes the barren woman to keep house and to be a joyful mother of children. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We worship you, Father. 
Father, I even pray right now that those that may be coming in with heavy hearts because of everything that is going on, you said in your word that in your presence there is the fullness of joy. So I thank you, Father, that even right now as we're collectively coming to worship you, collectively coming to adore you, that you are releasing that supernatural joy, that joy that surpasses everything that is happening, even the peace. Hallelujah. You said that you would give us perfect peace who mind is stayed on you. So we thank you that right now that you release joy in our worship. Hallelujah. You release that perfect peace that cast all of our fears away, Father, right now in this worship experience. Hallelujah. And you are allowing us to be encouraged. You are allowing us to be motivated on the inside. Hallelujah. Because in your presence, there's the fullness. So we worship you for the fullness of your joy. We worship you for the fullness of your presence. Hallelujah. We worship you, Father, because he who has begun a good work in us, that even in this season of hurt, even in this season of pain, even in this season of where is Yah or why is all of this happening, that you are still allowing us to rejoice in you. You are allowing us to be in praise and adoration because of you. There is a hope of everything that's going on. There is a way of escape and we can get into this place of worship. Hallelujah. We can get into this place of praise. Hallelujah. And I pray, Father, that even right now, that you are allowing us to be encouraged, that we are open our mouths and our hearts unto you this morning. And we say, come and dwell. Hallelujah. Come and live in our worship this morning. Hallelujah. Come and breathe the breath of Ruach. Because even when we say hallelujah, we're releasing the breath of Yah. Hallelujah. We're releasing the Ruach HaKadosh. So we worship you. We give your name praise, glory, and honor. Because there's nobody like our Yah. There's nobody like you. Thank you, Father, that he who has been done a good work in us, that, Father, you're so faithful to fulfill it. You're so faithful to bring it into full manifestation. And we worship you. Come on, wherever you are, just open your mouths and give y'all some worship this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. With our hands lifted up and our mouths filled with praise, we worship you this morning. Hallelujah. We thank you, Father. We honor you, Father. Hallelujah. Glory be to your name, Father. Yeah. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to his name. He's so worthy to be praised. Continue to worship him as we go before him in song. Yeshua at the center of it all. Yeshua at the center of it all. Every knee will bow and every tongue shall confess you, Yeshua, Yeshua, Yeshua at the center of it all, Yeshua at the center of it all, every knee will bow, and every tongue shall confess you, Yeshua, Yeshua, cause nothing else matters, nothing else matters, everything revolves around you, Yeshua, you. 
Yeshua at the center of my life. Yeshua at the center of my life. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Yeshua. Yeshua, nothing else matters. Yeshua, you are at the center of it all. Yeshua, you're the center. Everything revolves around you. Yeshua, you, Yeshua, be the center of my life. Yeshua, be the center of my life. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Yeshua. Yeshua, nothing else matters. Nothing in this world will do. Because Yeshua, you're the sinner. Everything revolves around you. Yeshua, you. From my heart to the heavens, Yeshua be the center. It's all about you. Yes, it's all about you. From my heart to the heavens, Yeshua be the center. It's all about you. Yes, it's all about you. From my heart to the heavens, Yeshua be the center. It's all about you. Yes, it's all about you. From my heart to the heavens, Yeshua be the center. It's all about you. Yes, it's all about you. Yeshua at the center of it all. Yeshua at the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be. It's always been you, Yeshua. Yeshua, nothing else matters. Yeshua, you're the center. Everything revolves around you. Yeshua, you. It is to you, Holy Father. No one like you. And I will bless your And 
Hallelujah. We can just continue in our worship regarding the Ruach HaKadosh. Hallelujah. Yeah. 
There's nothing worth more. No one can compare your living hope. Your presence, yeah. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware, more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Your presence is yes, the sweetest thing we'll ever your presence, yes, the greatest place will ever be, right here in your presence, yeah. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and feel the Your glory yeah, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, yeah. Oh. Glory to your name, yeah. Come on, Israel, just worship all over. Hallelujah. In your respective homes. Hallelujah. Where you are, just worship the Most High. He's worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. Praise Yah. Hallelujah. 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 In my presence is fullness of joy. In my right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Hallelujah. Something about basking and soaking in the presence of the Most High. Soaking in the presence. So in the Ruach HaKadosh, you are welcome in this place. Hallelujah. Come and abode and abide in this tabernacle. Dwell, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most Hallelujah. High. Dwell in this place. We magnify you. Magnify Hallelujah. simply doesn't mean to blow up. How can someone who is gargantuan, someone who's bigger than life itself, someone who oh, is beyond the figment of our imagination, how can we, how can we blow up something that's already been? So, but we magnify you in the sixth of the Hebraic way. And in the Hebraic way, what we do is to magnify means that now we see a different aspect of you that we didn't see before. It doesn't mean to blow you up because how can you blow up someone who's bigger than big, someone who's gargantuous than gargantuan? But we begin to see a different aspect from you, Father Yah. We see a different characteristic from you. As our ancestors said back in Mizraim, they said, we have not known a power like this. We have not known a God like this. Certainly they have known him. They know him as a promise giving Elohim, Hallelujah. but they didn't know him as a promise keeping Keep Elohim. Hallelujah. So in this season, we know you Lord. not as one who has been Hallelujah. given your promises, but we as Israel Hallelujah. know you as the Elohim, as the power, as the God who is a God who keeps Keep his promises. promises. So Hallelujah. we magnify you, which means now we see a different characteristic. Lord. We see Hallelujah. a different dynamic. We see you not just Lord. as an icon to be venerated, Hallelujah. but we see you as a paradigm to be replicated. Hallelujah. Let this mind be in you that was also in your Husha Hamasya. We bless you. We praise you. We give you glory. We give you honor Hallelujah. for there is none like you from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. Yahuwah's name is worthy to be praised.
praise. Hallelujah. 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 He is worthy and worthy. Hallelujah. As the psalmist said, with the hallelujah, with the fruit of my lips. Hallelujah. Do I magnify him? Hallelujah. 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 Let everything that have breath. Praise Yahuwah. Hallelujah. Praise Yahuwah. Hallelujah. Shabbat Shalom, Israel. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Isn't it amazing that we are a unique species? Hallelujah. That we're more than just a collective piece of, of DNA, that uniquely within our human anatomy, our physiology, Yah dwells in the praises of his people. He dwells when we praise, he dwells in the praises of his people. We are a special people unto him. Blessed be the name above all names, for whereby there's no name given under the Shamayim, whereby man shall be saved. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And isn't it amazing that he had called us by that same name? Yes. If my people who are called oh, by God. his name, name uniquely within the infrastructure of your physiology, within your human anatomy, y'all put his DNA. Yes. You are made in his image. You are made in his likeness. And he said that when you praise I get inside, I inhabit, I dwell, I tabernacle, I sukkot inside of your praises. Hallelujah. 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 That's why our praise steal the avenger. It steals the avenger. Woo! Judah has a unique sound of praise. There's none like Judah. You know, if you recall in scripture, you remember where, you know, um, when you talk about rejection, you remember Leah, the scripture says that she was tendered eye. She was tender eye. And therefore, of course, Jacob didn't want her. Jacob uh, did not find her to be um, this, this specimen of, of attraction. And the scripture says that he did not uh, want her. He was not in love with her, rather. And so she said, if I gave him a son, so the first son was born to her was Reuben. It was Reuben. And she said, well, uh, Reuben literally means uh, son. Maybe he'll accept me if I give him a son. And of course, he did not accept her, although he had a son. Second son we know was born, of course, is, is Simeon. And Simeon, he said, well, maybe if I, it means promise, maybe if I give him this, maybe he will see me. It means to look or to behold. Maybe he will see me again. Maybe he, he will look at me. And that wasn't the case. Then the third son she gave uh, birth to uh, through Jacob, our ancestor, our poor father, was Levi. Levi means commitment. That maybe now this man ain't looking at me. This man doesn't accept me. I am in this isolated place where I am, I am vying for his attention. I'm looking for um, some type of, of, of attention from this man. And this man did not, not giving me his attention. And so therefore, of course, she said, if I give birth to Levi, Levi literally means commitment, then maybe he will commit to me. And we know that he did not commit to her. Then she, she stopped looking for the approval of man. Because whenever you look for the approval of man, what happens is neutralize your worship unto the most high. That's why you cannot seek the approval or the opinion of others or it's going to impede your worship unto the most high. And so she gave birth to this last son called Judah. Judah was her fourth son born and Judah means praise. She said, I'm gonna stop seeking the approval of man and I'm going to just worship the father. That's what we do to overcome Woo! centuries of rejection, Hallelujah. isolation, Glory. abandonment, what we call Lodibar, the spirit Glory. of Mephibosheth, Lodibar, a place that is lonely, a place where nobody wants you, a place 
where you are preaching the truth and sharing the truth and you're isolated. At some point, you have to overcome the opinions of others and get to the place where you're just going to Judah. Woo! Praise him. Judah means I can care less about the opinions of others. And I'm going to get into a posture just to praise him. Let's praise him, Judah. Hallelujah. 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 To the lion Hallelujah. of Hallelujah. Yahudah. Praise Yah. To the lion of Ooh. Yahudah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just a couple of announcements really quickly. Tomorrow, join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Again, that's 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. tomorrow during our Shavuot, our Shavuot service in which many call in the Greek tongue Pentecost, but it's our Shavuot service. And so you can um, connect with us on Zoom. The Zoom ID is 436-916-7011. Three. Again, seven, zero, one, three. And so we know that um, millions around the world are going to, praise God, millions around the world are going to uh, connect as we celebrate this Moedim, this feast day. Uh, the scripture tells us in Leviticus, of course, uh, there is 49 days or seven weeks. And then on the 50th day is Shavuot. So it's more than just Christians understand it as the giving of the Ruach or the Holy Spirit. But for those who study the scriptures and know the scriptures, know that its meaning has far more significance than just the giving of the Ruach. This is the establishment of the new covenant or the renewed covenant, according to Ezekiel chapter 36, Jeremiah chapter 31. It is the renewed covenant that he promised that he will put his spirit in us why? That will remind us of the law, that he's going to write down the law on the tablets of our hearts. As he removed his hearts of stone or tablets that was written by, given to Moshe, and now he's going to replace it with the heart of, a heart of flesh, so that he can now put his spirit and write his law upon the tablets of our hearts. So Shavuot means so much more than just, just Hikam it's so much more than um, glossa um, uh, laleya. It's so much more than just uh, speaking in tongues. It's so much more than just uh, this charismatic ambience. For us, it, it includes that for the charismatic believer, but it also includes this is that now Yah has written the law upon our hearts that we might follow this law. Hallelujah. And the testimony of Yahushua HaMashiach. So again, join us on Monday nights. Praise God. We ask that you join us on Monday nights for Moray Roundtable. We have an exciting topic for you on this upcoming Monday, but that would be at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on our YouTube, I'm sorry, on our Facebook Live. So you can look Great Awakening H2N as Hebrews to Negroes International, and you will find us live on Facebook. Praise God. Also, I uh, want to encourage you just to go to our website, find out we have updates all the time on our website concerning the Great Awakening. Also, please join us on every Thursday night at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for our Torah Life Scripture Study. And so we study Torah. Uh, Torah is the scripture. It is the term, the Greek term, graphe. So everywhere you see scripture in the Bible is re it's referenced referencing Torah, so our scripture study. So again, go to our website and find out a lot of initiatives we have going on. Do want to mention, um, just very briefly, uh, want to mention our Hebrew Academy, which starts this upcoming Monday. So if you have not registered for classes, or you, if, you have, uh, if you're interested in registering for classes, you can go to www.thehaod.org or hebrewacademyofdetroit.org. We have classes, Hebrew Life Cycles and Customs by Maura Unglove Austin, which will be on Monday nights. We also have scripture interpretation that will start a week from tomorrow on June 7th. Um, for those individuals who want a deeper, um, a deeper understanding of the scriptures and various techniques and methodologies in what we call Hebrew hermeneutics in order to properly understand and exegete the scriptures so it will make sense to you 
and you can comprehend the word of the Most High. Also, biblical feasts, this would be on Monday nights as well for those who want a better understanding of the Moedims um, from Passover to the Feast of the Eleven to First Fruits to Shavuot, in which we will be observing tomorrow to Yom Teruah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, Feast of Tabernacles, you will get a great understanding of that, as well on Thursday night's Hebrew language by Moray, Moray Zion Lex. So if you want a good understanding of the Hebrew language, Hebrew language is crucial. Uh, if you don't understand Hebrew language, then you don't know half of the scriptures. Uh, you need to know the language in order to fully understand the importance of the scriptures and how the, the scriptures is situated. Also, Hebrew scriptures itself. So this is what most people call the Old Testament or the Tanakh. And so the Tanakh includes the Torah, the writings in the prophets. Uh, the Mashiach said, I didn't come to uh, destroy or to abolish the law, which is Torah, and the prophets, um, Nayavim, but I come to fulfill. I come to bring full clarity. And so you cannot understand the Tanakh in its its original authorial intentions without understanding who Christ is or who the Mashiach, because they all point to him. Everything, its literary style, its form, every narrative, uh, every Deuteronomic, every Deuteronomistic, uh, every law, every king, the split of the Northern Kingdom, the Southern Kingdom, the whole history of the Hebrew scriptures all point to one individual. That's why we as a nation of people that the Most High promised Dawid that through his seed or through his seed will come a emancipator for Israel and that other nations can cleave. That is the purpose of why the Mashiach have come the first time and we know he will be coming again. And then Hebrews and Negroes 2, this class will be held on Wednesday nights, one of our signature classes by Ron Dalton Jr., um, the renowned author as well as movie maker. Then defending the biblical law on Wednesday nights as well. So if you want a good grasp in terms of how to defend the biblical law, uh, it is, is as plain as a day in terms of the scripture that the law is not abolished or done away with. So that would be on Wednesday nights. Also Hebrew Academy for Kids is Lion's Well. And so we have four unique programs um, for everyone. And that is of course, Hebrew language, Hebrew culture, as well as Hebrew uh, history and business. So we're offering business classes for children. So the Hebrew Academy for children are from ages five to 17. Again, you want to go to uh, HebrewAcademyofDetroit.org or the HAOD.org to register your child. Praise Yah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And again, we want to keep reminding all of our co tees for those that would like to become a part of the Shek Kayel, which is the Great Awakening Detroit Women's Ministry, hallelujah. We meet every Tuesday, well, starting again after Shavuot. We're gonna meet on Tuesdays at seven o'clock p.m. This is our opportunity for prayer and share. It is definitely a co tease a powerful demonstration of love, unity, and to see the vision or the purpose and the plan that Yah has for his daughters of Zion. So that is again on Tuesdays at seven o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you would like to be a part of this group, you can send us uh, an email through the Great Awakening 400, or you can also look us up on the web. I mean, not just the web, but on Facebook. Send us a message and we will send you that information. Hallelujah. Also, the Weeping Daughters of Rachel, hallelujah, it is in full-fledged planning, hallelujah, not planning, we are kicking this off on Sunday, June the 7th at 7 o'clock p.m. We are asking all ladies, all the co-teams that if you have not registered, please go to the Great Awakening, uh, the Great Hebrew Awakening website, look for the Weeping Daughters of Rachel, and go ahead and register. The registrations are coming in. This is again, this is an initiative of the Great Hebrew Awakening uh, International. This is our time for women to come together worldwide that we're crying out on behalf of the Rachel daughters and children. Uh, this is 
exists of a prayer team for healing and deliverance to prevent the conditions that come against Yah's people and even what's happening in the earth right now. This is again, it's going to kick off our very first prayer call. It's Sunday, June the 7th at 7 o'clock p.m. If you need that information, all ladies, Akotis, have to go through the registration process. And also in that, when you go to the website, there it is right there. Not only do you get a wonderful opportunity to register so that we can have all of your information, but there are also ways that you can submit a prayer request. Hallelujah. You can submit a prayer request. And if there are praise reports or things that you would like to share with us, there's also an opportunity for you to do that as well. So you can put a prayer request, submit your prayer request, or if you want to submit a praise report because of something that Yah has done, even in the midst of our prayer calls, please do that. So again, we are encouraging all the co-teams and it is growing daily uh, for you guys to go ahead and get registered so you can be a part of our very first call, which is again, Sunday, June 7th at seven o'clock PM. Hallelujah. 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 We also want to uh, remind the Mishpaha and for those individuals who um, really have a passion for um, for evangelism and for uh, witnessing and sharing what we call the great news. So the great news is not just to pursue the gospel and every man, every boy of every creed and every color and every tongue needs to hear the gospel, but they also need to know who they are. So we call that the great news. And that's why the Mashiach, Christ said, go, don't go into the way of the, of the Gentiles just yet, but I want you to go unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And so we have a responsibility to go to the lost sheep, to take this good news, to share their identity, those individuals who were disconnected from their heritage, as the scripture says in Jeremiah chapter 17 and four, that uh, I will disconnect you from your heritage that I gave you. And so heritage is very important. So. Uh, if you go to the website, go to About Us, go to Tracks. We have some companion tracks to help you share the great news with uh, your companions, with your friends, with your associates, with your coworkers. So track number one is just who are African-Americans? Who are we? Based on scholarship, based on the, the scriptures, based on literary consistency and the whole gamut. This explains who we are based on, again, corroborating accounts, DNA, genetics, uh, archeological studies, anthropological studies, et cetera. So people can understand who we are and that we are the people of the book, that who we say we are, we are, and that our claims have veracity. And there is a myriad of information to prove that. And then of course, the awakening, just what is the awakening? So in this track includes salvation for Israel, the law, the Sabbath, um, as also you got to accept Christ. That's very important. But how do you walk out the awakening? How do you walk and restore the ancient path? How do you do that? And so there's a companion. So you can go to the website and we do not charge for these. We just charge for you printing them up. So you have to print them and get them mailed, but there is no profit that we make off these here. This is about sharing the great news with everyone that has ears to hear. Praise Yah. Hallelujah. 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 So uh, that's important. Also 24 seven prayer. We know that many uh, in our assembly are still praying. Praise Yah. Uh, we, prayer is not an initiative of our, of our assembly. It is the very heartbeat. It is the lifeline of what we do. It's not an initiative, but prayer itself is part of the culture and the DNA of our assembly. And so um, we ask that you continue to stay on your watch. Um, we want to be known as a house of prayer, according to the scriptures. This is what the Mashiach have said. My father's house should be called the house of prayer. So we want to make sure that because of the assignment we have, which is a very difficult, very arduous assignment, it is assignment that um, has a lot of opposition, not only from humanity, but we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Principalities do not like the awakening, particularly because it get into the eyes of those individuals who 
have a certain dogma or dogma. And I'll, I'll mention that a little later in terms of the washing of the word. And so that's why it's going to, it's going to, to stimulate some demonic magistrates, some powers that be. And so we wanna make sure that we always in a posture to be in prayer. Prayer is our lifeline for the believer. If my people will call by my name, shall humble themselves and pray. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, so we have a treat for you all. We're going to do the Hebrew word of the week. Hebrew word of the week. Praise God. And Hallelujah. It is none other than Mora Tawana Howard. I know you're used to hearing Maura James, um, but we thought that we would mix it up a little bit uh, this morning. And do we will hear from Mora? Hallelujah. I am so excited, Mishpaha, to be able to share uh, what the Ruach had just been giving me over the last few weeks concerning understanding, constantly understanding who we are. And I know that many of us, we can be in so many different levels when it comes to understanding who we are as Yah's chosen people and understanding the Hebraic faith. And I know that my audience, and when I say my audience, I'm talking about on Facebook and on social media, um, may be a different audience from those that are faithful followers of my dear husband, uh, Dr. Ken Howard. So I always want to be able to go back to some basic fundamental understanding so that we can continue to not only be a light, but to be an answer in the midst of all of these questions that the world and society are asking, why are we in the state that we are in? Hallelujah. And so for these last couple of Sabbaths uh, worship experience, Maura James last week, he talked about, he talked on the power of the covenant and what the covenant itself looks like. And he did such a beautiful job in understanding that. So just to make a long story short, so when we uh, begin to talk about who we are as Yah's chosen people, sometimes people ask, why does it matter? Hallelujah. Why does it matter? Because Christianity have had us in this false reality that we are all equal and that, and that no one is greater than the other. But there is so much degradation that's happening to us that now the world is looking for answers. So we know that in Deuteronomy chapter 28, it, it gives us a brief, not a brief, but it gives us a very uh, detailed understanding of why does it matter? Hallelujah. It, it matters because for those that have been following us, we know in Exodus, we made the covenant with Yah when Moses received the commandments on Mount Sinai, and he brought it to the people. Not when he got through telling or, or explaining what these commandments were, all the people answered with one voice said, yes, we received this and yes, we will honor it. So when we get to Deuteronomy 28 and it talks about the blessings and the curses, why does it matter? In, in understanding this covenant agreement, we know that Deuteronomy 28 verses 45 and 46 says that Yah, our Yah, would cause curse, would bring a curse upon Israel. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because of their disobedience. And it would be used as a sign to identify who the true children of Israel are. And it would be upon our children's children forever. There is a cry right now that is going on in the world saying, why are our people constantly falling into the hands of our oppressors? Why are we constantly going through so many degradations that is killing and destroying us? So we see right here in scripture that in 45, all these curses will come upon you. They will pursue you and overtake you until you are destroyed. Why? Because you did not obey the Lord, our Elohim, and observe the commandments and decrees that he have gave you. They will be a sign and a wonder to you that you are what? His descendants forever. So I said, okay, so let's look at this from a different angle. What does it mean in this scripture in Deuteronomy 28 verses 
uh, 16 through 18. What does it mean? Hallelujah. The word curse. What does it mean in its original Hebrew meaning? The word curse right here in verses 16 through 18 is the Hebrew word ara. Ara. That's A-R-A-R. -R. And this word ara, come on, for those that is familiar with Paleo-Hebrew, Paleo-Hebrew takes our words and they are in a picture. They have a gematria, which is a number, and then they have this actual meaning. So this word ara means curse. That means curse in Deuteronomy 28 verses 16 through 18 is made up of two Paleo-Hebrew words, which is olive and resh. Come on, I want you to just flow, flow with me because we're going to see right in scripture what does this word curse actually means. When talking about Yah's chosen people, when we fell in disobedience, he said that we will be cursed or he will curse us. So let's keep going. So the word R is a Hebrew verb whose paleo letters are Aleph and Resh, Aleph, Resh. But because we read Hebrew from right to left, it would read Resh, Aleph, Resh, Aleph, okay? Hallelujah. So we know that Resh is the symbol of the head of a man that can appear or represent one who is bent over. I'm going to say that again. Resh is the symbol of the head of a man that can appear or represent one who is bent over. So when we move to Olive, Olive is the symbol of an ox head that represents what? Power, authority, strength, and leadership. Come on, we're talking about understanding what this word curse means. Hallelujah in Deuteronomy 28. So in this word R, we see two olives and two resh, which is representing two heads and the strength or the authority of two oxen, right? So when we put those symbols and their meanings or representations together, we can see or form the definition of ara, which is cursed, like this. The one who is the head, Yahuwah, would give power and authority to another head, our oppressors, that will cause us to be bent over while serving under their leadership. Come on, right there in the very word curse in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 16, 17, and 18, when Yah said, curse are we in the fields, curse are we, we can see that he made a covenant Come on, because we're getting ready to move to the Dramatrian numbers of these uh, olive, paleo, paleo words. So again, it's two olives, two rich, which means there's two heads and two power authority of leadership. And so let's read it again. The one who is the head, rich, will give power and authority, olive, to another head, rich, that will cause us to be bent over, still part of rest, while serving under their leadership, Allah. It's right there. Come on, let's keep moving. Hallelujah. So does this mean our Yah made a covenant agreement with our oppressors because of our disobedience? Yes. Let's dive into scripture interpretation. So in that word R, we saw again two heads, representing Allah, and we saw two rich, represent power authority, hallelujah. And so within those, for those that know uh, anything about Paleo-Hebrew, we also have numbers, it's called gematria. And Allah carries the value of two. Within scripture interpretation, we find that the number two always denote the establishment of a covenant agreement. It takes two or more people to come together to make a covenant agreement. Okay, let's look at a precept. Look at, we're gonna look at Amos 
three and three. It says, can two, which is the both of them, walk together except they be agreed? So guess what? I looked up that word agree. We're talking about the power of two. The first, we're talking about the gematria number of olive, which is two. So let's look at what that word agree means in Amos three and three. The word agree in Hebrew here means your ad. Hallelujah. And so what does your ad mean? We're talking about this covenant agreement that Yah made a covenant agreement with our oppressors because of our disobedience. So right here, we see that Yah, let me go back. It says that the word agreed in Hebrew means Yah, which means to meet at a summit or appointed time. It means to be betrothed or marriage, i.e. covenant. Can two walk together unless they be agreed? We're talking about now we move from the meaning of Allah and, and, and Resh to now move into the, the number, the gematria number of Allah, which is two. And guess what? I mean, which is one. I'm sorry, which is one. But when you add them two together, because there's two olives, now there's two, which means the power of agreement, right? When we move to Resh, Resh uh, gematria number, guys, is 200. In the word Ara for curse, there are two Resh. So when we add together, 200 and 200, what do we get? We get 400. Woo! So when we add 400 together, we begin to see how many years in the beginning throughout Torah and even now have the children of Israel been enslaved by our oppressors. So I want you to see that even in the meaning, the representation of the word curse, the Hebrew word ara, not only do we see the meaning that Yah, our Yah, will give power and authority, the head will give power and authority to another head that will cause us to be bent over while serving under their leadership. That's the meaning of R for curse. Now in the gematria, in the numbers, we see two olives that one olive means one, but when we add it together, there's two. So now Amos 3 and 3 makes sense. The power of agreement that our Yah made a covenant agreement with our oppressors because of our disobedience to allow these curses to come upon us. And how long did it last? Now you have rest. Rest, the gematria number is 200. We had two rest. So now that's 200 plus 200 equals 400. So now we have been enslaved through our oppressors for over 400 plus years. It makes sense. We see it in the Hebraic understanding, Torah coming to life in Deuteronomy chapter 28. So you, I can hear you saying, okay, Pastor P.T. Moore, Tawana, give me a precept on that. Let's look at this Jeremiah 34, verses 18 through 20. The men who have violated my covenant have not fulfilled the terms of the covenant they made before me. I will treat you like the calf they cut in two. That's a power of agreement, covenant. Whenever there's a covenant, guys, there has to be bloodshed. And there was blood shed throughout every covenant that existed in the Torah. You're seeing it right here, but let's keep moving. So the men who have violated my covenant, the children of Israel, and have not fulfilled the terms of the covenant they made before me, I will treat you like the calf they cut in two, power of agreement, covenant, and then walk between its pieces. And all the people of the land who walk between the pieces of the calf, children of Israel, I will hand them over to their enemies. And their dead bodies will become food for the bird and the air and the beasts of the field. You see it right there, a precept where Yah made a covenant agreement with our oppressors because of our disobedience. 
is, and he handed over us over to our enemies. Hallelujah. So why does it matter? Why is it that we have to understand and get to know why we are being under such a curse and all of these things are happening? It's because the covenant was given to us. And it is still in effect right now. And he's saying that in order for us to break the curse, in order for us to see the manifestation of Yah's chosen people, because we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation unto him, peculiar people, that he said that he's going to cause us to come out of darkness and into his marvelous light. But we have to return back to his laws, statutes, and commandments. So here again, the number two denotes authority, establishment of a covenant agreement. 400 denotes 400 plus years of continuing in enslavement. Hallelujah, Genesis 15, verse 13. And he said unto Abram, know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them and they shall afflict them. Here's the precept, 400 years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, hallelujah. And afterwards, here's the promise. With every covenant, there's the condition there's promises and there's a sign. Here is our promise that also that nation whom they serve, Yah is going to judge our oppressors. And afterwards, we shall come out with great substance, hallelujah, when we hallelujah. return back to his laws, statutes, and commandments. Yah, hallelujah. Guys, it is in the Torah understanding that this word curse is so powerful from the meaning to the gematria number is right before us. We are a great nation and we have to return back to Yah, laws, statutes, and commandments so that all things can be restored. Hallelujah. Yeah. Praise Yah, powerful, powerful. Praise Yah for Mora Tawana. Praise Yah, precept upon precept upon precept. Hallelujah for the wonderful teaching here. The anointed prophetess. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mora Tawana. Praise Yah, that was indeed powerful. Some precepts on what she had said. Hallelujah. All right, it's uh, time for Teruma. Teruma. Hallelujah. Teruma. A gift that keeps giving and giving and giving. We just heard a powerful, powerful uh, Hebrew word of the week from Mora Tawana. Praise Yah. And uh, now it's your opportunity to, to give. The Mashiach said, um, you render Caesar what belongs to him, but you render the most high what gives to him. Notice he did not say give in the sense that we know give. The term give and in our dialect would be that I'm given something that uniquely belongs to me. I'm giving it to you. But in from the Hebraic standpoint, the Mashiach said you render in essence to render means I'm given back to someone what already belongs to them. You cannot give to Yah what already belongs to him. Even your body, if you submitted and yielded your body unto him, you presented your body as a living sacrifice. Everything you do already belongs to him. The earth is his. The fullness thereof. Cattle on a thousand hills. Everything belongs to the most high. Hallelujah. So, you know, we don't do uh, tithes here. Hallelujah. But we do do free will offerings according to the scripture. Let's see what teruma. Teruma is a Hebrew expression, which is Hebrew for heave offering. Now, Teruma was very specific because Teruma gives instructions concerning tabernacle and furnishing. So to help build a place so that you and Yah can meet. Now, Yah is in our hearts. He dwells in our hearts, but he always established a public place 
so that the people can have a holy mikra, is the Hebrew term, or holy convocation, a solemn assembly. They always, Yah always want to connect with you. So notice Exodus or Shemot chapter 25, verse 8, and let them make me a what? Sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. There's something about corporate worship that Yah that gets the attention of Yah. Can you get Yah's attention unilaterally? Absolutely. Can you um, get his attention independently in your room? Absolutely, positively, unequivocally, without question? Yes, you can. But there's something about his presence that he shows up in a greater magnitude in a corporate place than he will ever do individually. So Exodus chapter 25, verse 2, speak unto the people of Israel that they may take for me a contribution to Ruma for um, every man whose heart moves him, he shall receive to, he shall receive the contribution from me, for me. In other words, whatever it says on your heart, whatever moves your heart to give for the contribution of building a sanctuary so that Yah can meet you. Now we know that Yah doesn't dwell in buildings made by man. But it's, watch this, it's his sanctuary that you are contributing to. Praise Yah. So let's do our Taruma. Hallelujah. So we'll read our Taruma Confession of Faith together on the count of three. One, two, three. Father Yah, I honor you as I present to you the first fruit of my increase. I recognize you as the authority over all I have. I put you in remembrance of your Torah. You said that if I will obey your commandments and honor you with my substance, you would honor me. Therefore, because of my obedience to the commandments and statutes, I call in a harvest of wisdom to manage my financial affairs, my financial favor, jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, benefits, promotions and advancements, favorable settlements, rebates and returns, the return of all that is lost and stolen, scholarships and grants, increased sales and commissions, increasing clients and customers, the miracle of debt cancellation, supernatural wealth transfer, innovative creative ideas, favorable financial surprises, every bill paid, every debt paid, short term and long term. I declare that I not only have enough, but I have more than enough. I have enough to feed, clothe, and provide ministry to the fatherless, the widow, poor, and underserved. Support the vision of the Great Awakening Assemblies and promote the gospel of Yeshua HaMashiach. I walk in the abundance of Yah. I am free from debt. I am the lender and not the borrower. The wealth of the wicked is being transferred to me, and I commit to use it to establish the kingdom of Yahuwah in the earth. I am ready to distribute, and my life is a distribution channel for Yahuwah's work in the earth. I am on the path of perpetual increase as I enter into my wealthy place. Wealth and riches are in my house in Yahshua's name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So for those that would like to give towards the Great Awakening, the Great Hebrew Awakening, as well as the Great Awakening Assemblies for all of the initiatives that Yah has placed in our hands, you can give two ways. You can do through uh, Cash App, which is the money sign, Great Awake, or you can also do it by PayPal, which is the Great Awakening 400. And we are so appreciative to everything that all have given even beyond monetary. Hallelujah. Thank you so much. Hallelujah. All right, Mishpaha. Praise Yah for your teruma, your contributions, as is laid on your heart. Anytime a man manipulate you or coerce you or have to use mental, uh, mental manipulation in order to coerce you to give, uh, that is not of Yah. But the scripture says, as it is put on a man's heart, let him give to Ruma to be a place where he and Yah can dwell, come to dwell together. So Hebrew apologetics, praise Yah, we're making excellent time. 
and uh, let's continue in that trajectory of time. Hebrew apologetics, be prepared to give an answer. First of all, uh, we would like to share the Omer and what's called in the Omer. For those who are new to the truth and new to the awakening, we want to give you a comprehensive biblical understanding of what is the Omer or what is counting to Shavuot. Say that with me. Shavuot. 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 So it's in Leviticus chapter 23, 15 through 16. Notice what the scripture says, and you shall count seven full weeks. Seven full weeks, as courts is 49 days, after the day of the Sabbath, Sabbaton, from the day that you brought the sheaf of wave offering. Now, whenever you see sheaf, you also see that as our ancestors cross the Red Sea and they begin to wave the sheaf because it always denotes victory. It always de denotes we are triumphant over something. So you're gonna wave the sheep of the way offering. You shall count 50 days the day after Sunday. Let's read it again. You shall count 50 days to the day because Christ rose early getting up early Sunday morning. Let's read that again. And you should count 50 days after early Sunday morning when he got up out of the grave. Let's read that again. You shall count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall present a grain offering of new grain to Yahuwah. So what are these verses saying? Basically, Passover and Shavuot, between Passover and Shavuot, there's a period of counting. So for those of us who are familiar with, of course, um, the Sabbath during the feast day of Pesach or feast week of Pesach, we know that we begin to count from that first Sabbath during the time and we begin to count seven consecutive Sabbaths. So amazingly, literally seven weeks ago, we celebrated, we were in the week of the Feast of the, of the Unleavened Bread or Passover week. So we count 50 days from first fruits offerings within the Passover week of the Feast of Shavuot or Pentecost. So in biblical times, the period of counting was observed by bringing an omer of barley, or barley to the temple and waving it before Yahuwah every day between Passover and Shavuot. Christians just espouse a different understanding of what Pentecost is. So this period of counting connects Passover with Shavuot. Why is this connection significant? Well, because Passover memorializes Israel deliverance from slavery in Mizraim. It's amazing that our folks celebrate everybody else's holiday, every other national origin, their holidays except ours. Come on. Our true freedom came, and there were several, whether we're talking about Mizraim or Assyrian or Babylon or Persia or, or the Greeks or the Romans. Um, we have had many milestones of what I call temporal victories. They were very short-lived, but we had them. And so, but it was a time for us to remember coming out of bondage. Shavuot was when, see, you see how when, when you allow Christians or any other religious, religious um, uh, paradigm to just, to, to strip you of your history. And they just, it's just called Pentecost Sunday. And we just, put it, but there is a historical component to why we do what we do. Everything in the Bible, there is a rhyme and a reason to, and it all centers around one group of people, one people group. So Shavuot is when the Most High gave the Torah to Israel. Most Christians don't know that. They think, oh, it was just they went in the upper room and the Holy Spirit fell on them and they began to They began to speak with other tongues. But no, they went to, it was a feast day. 
they were going to Shavuot. And all Israelites went to Jerusalem during three times a year. And this was the second time in the year they went during Shavuot. So that's why the Messiah says, go to Jerusalem and wait. Because also, we'll talk to you tomorrow, this was um, reminisce, reminiscent of when the Most High gave Moshe or Moses the Torah on Mount Sinai. You'll see a lot of similarities there. Right? So in other words, the festival of deliverance is connected to the festival of sanctification. Shavuot memorialized the giving of Torah and the Torah is Yah's means of sanctifying his people. Hallelujah. You can't be sanctified without Torah. It is what set us apart. That's what sanctification means. Kodesh means to be set apart. Torah sets us apart. So deliverance leads to what? Sanctification. Sanctification leads to what? Obedience. Thus, Passover is completed at Shavuot. This period of counting, the counting of Omer, reminds us that even though we've been freed from Egypt, we are truly not freed until we are walking in obedience to Torah. So that's why Yahusha has set us free from our Egyptian oppressions, but also from the slavery as Shaul, Rabbi Shaul or Paul says, the slavery of sin and death. You're no longer under the law of sin and death, but now Yah through Yahusha has given us grace that we no longer die as a result of breaking Torah. But our story does not end there. Now we receive the Torah and commit to walking in obedience. We have been set free so we can live as free people. No matter what America or any other Babylonian system that tries to oppress us, that marginalize us, that capitalize off of our intrinsic misidentification. That's why Torah defines what that looks like. Torah defines our freedom, not any political establishment. It's Torah that defines our freedom. So let's look at some contradictions really quick. Here's where the apologetics come in. Because Pentecost contradiction, Christian doctrine contradicts the scriptures. Because millions of Christians tomorrow will celebrate Pentecost Sunday. You're going to see pastors all over on your timeline. Pentecost, they're going to be wearing red and some wearing white. And uh, they're going to have a Holy Ghost good time. But the fact that it is observed on Sunday exposes two lies that are perpetuated by the modern Christian church. Number one, that the Sabbath changed to Sunday. That's the case. They should be, work, they should be observing Pentecost on Monday. Why do they call it Pentecost Sunday? Why can't why don't they call it Pentecost Pentecost Monday? Because you got to count 50 days. Also, it exposes the lie, the fabricated lie, which is, have been really have been forced down the throats of our people for centuries, this regurgitated dogma that Yahusha rose on his Sunday. So if the aforementioned were true, Christians would call it Pentecost Monday. So let's get to Sabbath, of course. Pentecost or Shavuot proves to us that the Sabbath never changed. We count what? 50 days. So let's say he rose on Sunday. Right? He rose on Sunday, early Sunday morning. Then they begin to count 50 days from there. First, you count seven weeks. You'll end up on a Sunday. But the 50th day will be a Monday. That's what we read in the scripture. It says, from the day after the Sabbath, you begin to count. Watch this. He rose on a, uh, a, they say he rose on a Sunday. In 50 days, if you count, it will be what? It will be a Monday. So it further proves the inconsistencies of modern Christianity. The modern Christianity is confused about the Bible. They are confused. They have inserted this synchronized paganism into the scriptures, and they have convoluted the scriptures. So always ask them, if you're going to count 50 days, why do we always celebrate it on a Sunday? So what they did is they tried to pick and choose what they do in terms of celebrating. So there's a lot of contradictions when it comes to uh, these two. It proves that the Sabbath never changed and that the resurrection occurred on the Sabbath, not a Sunday. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. All right. So 
Let's get into this really quick. We're making good time. Y'all might be out of here. Praise y'all by 10 o'clock tonight. Praise y'all. Just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. All right. Well, let's um, talk about Moray's Lottery. I'm excited about this teaching. I'm excited about what the Most High will reveal to you. I pray that your hearts will be open. It will be receptive to hear what the Ruach, what the Spirit will say unto the assemblies. Um, so we rebuke the spirit of error and we release the spirit of accuracy so that we might hear from Yahuwah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As to what he might say to his people. His people. Praise Yah. What he might say to his people. Praise Yah. Adjust it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, we'll get there. We'll get there somehow. Yes. No, go down. No, go down. Okay. Yeah, let me, let me do it. There we go. All right. Need some help? No. Only that's why why we call a help meet. Okay. All right, help me is the Hebraic expression um, where we get the word Eleazar, um, but Azar, Azar means uh, help. Uh, so hey, I, help me is Azar, it means a covering. So yeah, I said that fellas, that that's what it means. Uh, Azar means a covering, but not covering as if a woman is head, but covering like a bark that covers a tree, uh, much like a, uh, a, a womb that covers a baby, much like skin that covers the bone. Um, it is to cover. And it's the same thing that Eve did um, when we look at it through precept upon precept, when we look at it through the exegetical lens of the scriptures, uh, we begin to see that as such. Praise Yah. So let's talk a little bit about um, Moray's latter reign. What do I mean by that? Are we being narcissistic? Um, what do we mean by this latter reign of Moray's? Why is there a re-establishment, a reawakening of mores? And what is a more? What is the significance of a more? Um, what can we gather and expose from these things? So let's start. Let's go to Genesis chapter 12. Let's go back from the beginning, Genesis chapter 12. Okay. Not for sure if more James is there, but if not, um, I will read. You want to read? Go ahead and read. Now the Lord said unto Abram. Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curse thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord has spoken unto him and Lot went with him. And Abram was 70 and five years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had got in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. And Abram passed through the land unto the place of Shem, Unto the plain, plain of Moray, and the Canaanites was then in the land. In the land. So I'd stop there really quickly, because just for a second, I want you want to look at Abraham. By the way, what is his name here in the text? Is it Abraham or is it Abram? Abram. Abram is in the text. So first of all, I want you all to know, please call your super Hebrew, your super Hebrews up. And tell them that that Dr. Howard said at this point, Abram is a Gentile. <laughs> Let me say it very slow to say it some more. Because I want this to agitate you. I wanted to get into your shana na na. I want to make sure that this metabolize. I want to make sure this disseminate. Abraham at this point is a Gentile. He's not a Hebrew by any stretch of the imagination. He's literally a Gentile. 
And that's why this is to remind them, remind, remind all, of, all these super Hebrews, that even though they know this, it almost shocked their system to remind them that our ancestor, our patriarch, that started all of the tribes of Israel was a Gentile from the beginning. That's why from the beginning, Yah called out his people from what? The four corners of the earth and began to bring out a people, a new people that started with Abraham. But he was not a Hebrew in the real sense of the word at this point. Watch this. So um, everyone knows the story about Abraham, of course, and uh, that his name changed eventually. And so we all know that, right? Everybody, everybody know that. But if anybody ever wonder why, what is the purpose behind y'all changing someone's name? How many of y'all know that, that Hebrew is an incredibly deep linguistic? It's a deep language that every single word has a meaning. Every character, every letter, it has a meaning. It, every letter is a number, as my wife mentioned in terms of Jamantra. And so um, built within the dynamic or the infrastructure of the Hebrew language is what we call the Bible code, right? Bible code. And this is a concept that use, use numbers and letters. And I, I bought that out last week that it's kind of this built into what we call a Hebrew matrix, so to speak. So that's why when we look at some of the old prophets and the sages and, and the old rabbis of old, you know what they would say? They say that Torah, every event that has happened in creation and that will ever happen is found in the first five books of Moses, everything. And we can go back to Isaiah chapter 46 that says that um, if you wanna know the end, you start from the beginning. Or Ecclesiastes chapter one, everything that has been done is gonna be done again. There's nothing new under the sun because how Yah works, Yah works in a secular fashion. And he uses numbers, he uses gematria, he uses language. In fact, we know that he created the world by using Hebrew. That's why he's gonna restore Zephaniah chapter three, that pure language. Because Hebrew is the only language that, that reveals the character of the Most High. It reveals the essence, it reveals his plans, it reveals his purpose, it reveals everything. So that's why we have to look at this, this Hebrew language and look at its letters and look at the names and look at the people associated with why. Because when Yah says, that he's going to change someone's name is for a reason. It's not just because it's neat and it's cool and it adds to the Bible, because that's how we read it in our American viewpoint. We think, oh, it's just cool. But no, Yah's, Yah put established names and every name means something. It has a particular purpose to it. It has a mission to it. And that's why it's important. So that's why before you were born, your mother and your father was thinking hard about what to name you. That's why when, 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 when couples get pregnant, the first thing that happens is they start thinking about a name. Even before it's a boy or girl, they start trying to figure out what they're gonna call. It's a boy, I'm gonna call him this. It's a girl, I'm gonna call him that. And, and that's one of the things that is popular in our culture when everybody's looking for a name. And that's why people rarely choose names without looking at a meaning. Isn't that strange? Meanings have everything to a name as we progress and we talk about Abraham because it's important. Like for instance, it's amazing in our culture that we don't like somebody named Malachi. We will never name our child Malachi. I never named my son Malachi. And that's the craziest thing in the world. <laughs> it's weird. Because <laughs> uh, <laughs> what on earth do, do that person's name have to do or something with that person's name disqualify it for, for, being, for your child being called the same name? It makes anything else. It, it has no rhyme. It's illogical. It makes no sense whatsoever you know, to do that. Um, but 
but Malachi, you know, Malachi can be a good name, but I think it's a good name. It has tremendous meaning. But because somebody you don't like, you choose not to do it. Now, let's get to Abraham. I want to bring some things out, right? So Abraham name literally means in Paleo Hebrew, Aleph, you see the ox head, Beit, Resh, Mem. Aleph, Beit, Resh, and Mem. So in Paleo Hebrew, the Aleph is an ox. For last week, we talked about it is the strength of a leader. In fact, Maura Tawana just brought that out. It is the strength of a leader. Beit, you see the second one there? Beit. So again, from Hebrew, we read not from left to right, but right to left. So you, the second one is Beit. And Beit means house. Then we get Rish. A Rish, it means the head of. And then we have the last letter there is Mem. This is the name of Abraham. Mem is water. Specifically, it's like the waters of Noah's flood. It's called, watch this, the former rain. Mm. It's called the waters of chaos. And although in, in English chaos, you know, although in English chaos, we think of this order, um, we think of something out of chaos, but this is not Yah's realm of thinking. Chaos is what washes away things and brings new life. So it's purposeful chaos. So whenever you see men, it's not just chaos, but it's purposeful chaos. It's yeah. organized chaos. So Abraham, the strength of the house, is the head of waters. And the word water, of course, or mem means sea or people. That's why his first name is Aleph Bet. Aleph Bet or Ab means father, as we say Abba. So he's a father of many nations or fathers of many seas or many waters. Water always denote people. So what does this mean? It means the strength of the house is the head of the waters because what happened is Yahuwah simply squeezed out a couple of things out of what we call the hay. Now, would you look at that? Because Abraham has a different meaning. What we do in order to get Abraham from Abram, pardon me, Abram means a father of many nations. That's what Yah promised him. But Abraham espoused a different meaning. Come on. So what we do is we put a gap in between. There's an opening in between the resh and the mem. Now, just in case, I want to make sure you're listening. The resh means what? Head. The head. And mem means what? Water. Water or people. people. So there had to be a separation between the head and the people. Do we ever find an event in Abraham's life where, or Abram's life, where Yah had to separate him from people? Yah had to separate him from people and notice what's there. What's added there, the difference between Abram and Abraham is the hay. The hay there, it goes in between. The hay means revelation. He didn't get revelation until he separated himself from people. He left Mesopotamia. He left his father and Puki and Ray Ray now. He left them. And as a result of leaving them, there was then hay or revelation. You will never get revelation depending on the wisdom of man. Operating in the realm independent from the most high, you'll never get revelation. So you only have chaos. That's what me and me. You only have chaos as a head. So that's why you need revelation. He received revelation or hey. Hey means to behold. It means to look. It means revelation. And that's why you see there, you see like a man with his hands up praising. Because now he has got revelation. He has something to praise. The revelation is that Yah deserves all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. And so Yah changed Abram name to Abraham, which changed the meaning of the name from strength of the house 
is the head of water to strip of the house who's the head of open revelation of water. Open revelation of water because now things begin to open up to him. So what happened with Abram's name or why was his name changed? And his wife's name was changed. His, his wife's names would change as well, right? What physically happened that came from them that allowed this open revelation? It was a new baby. Something came through, watch this, waters. That's why a water, a woman's water break. Something came through waters. What came through that water, there was waters of what? Chaos. There, and there was, always, there was always controversy. Remember, there was controversy surrounding the birth because she felt that that's why Sarai literally means I'm going to take things into my own hands. You're going to see that momentarily. But there was open revelation. Open revelation. And that's why Abram's name was changed. Because prior to that, he had no purpose. He had no mission. He had really no calling. But when Yah changed his name, he changed his mission. He changed his purpose. He changed his calling. Look at Sarai. Sarai is Shin, Resh, and Yod. Shin, Resh, Yod. It's the all-consuming fire. That's what shin means. Shin means fire. All-consuming fire, remember we said resh is head, is the head, and then we have the yod, which means the right hand of power. Right hand of power. So shin is this teeth or is consuming fire of Yah, the fire of Yah, or it also means to destroy or to consume Resh is the head of, the head of, and Yo is the right hand or strength of power. So what did Sarah try to do? Sarah means to consume the head through the hand of power. When Yah told her that she was going to get pregnant, she laughed at Yah. Then she decided that I'm going to take matters into my home. What? That's yeah. the word Yo hands and i'm going to cause now i'm going to help yah out yah needs some help and that's why when he didn't talk to sarah and abraham for 17 long years go read genesis chapter 16 and genesis chapter 17 for 17 long years he didn't talk to them in other words he said i am the almighty when he revisited abraham he said i am the almighty yah in other words i don't need your help I was silent from you. I withheld myself from you or withdrew myself from you because you operated in your own yod, your own strength. Woo. So Sarah is all consuming fire is the head of the right hand. Right, right in the right hand. But when her name changed, unbelievably, a hey, Woo. same way that Abraham, a hay is introduced into her name. There is a hay in her name. Remember we said hay means revelation. It means revelation. It revealed, it dropped the yod. That's what Sarah means. Sarai means you have the yod in it, which means I'm gonna take matters to my own hand. It's the power of my own strength, the strength of my own power. But when her name was changed to Sarah, revelation was given that you are going to the same thing we read in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, the prophecy that you will crush his head and he will bruise your heel. And it's going to come through the seed of a woman. She got revelation that she cannot do it in her strength. You cannot fight the God of this world, Hasatan, in your own strength, in your own power. You have to have revelation that there's someone coming down the line that's coming through your seed that's going to crush his head. Woo! You can't do it in your own strength by trying to get Hagar to produce a seed when she 
doesn't have the right lineage or blood that's going to produce a seed that's going to crush the head of the God of this world. So it is all consuming fire is the head of revelation. That's what Sarah means. That's what God changed is the, um, what do you call it, um, unbiblical cord? It was the unbiblical cord of Yah was opened up because it revealed an all-consuming fire, which is the head. That is revealed that the head that will come from Abraham and Sarah or the seed that will be revealed through what? The opening of her womb. Without Isaac, there would not be Jacob. There would not be Israel. So it was revelation that not through the seed of Hagar, who was an Egyptian, but no, through the seed of Sarah, because Genesis chapter three says it's going to be through the seed of a woman and women do not produce seeds. So Sarah and Abraham's name, literally, literally, the, it means the entire purpose and journey was changed when y'all changed their name. Let's dig a little deeper, right? That's just because now we just, we're just skimming through it. But let's dig a little deeper. Let's skim through this a little bit deeper. Go back to Genesis chapter 12, verse 5. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan. And into the land of Canaan they came. And Abram passed through the land unto the place of Shechem, unto the plain of Moreh. And the Canaanite was then in the land. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Go back to verse 6. And Abram passed through the land into the place of Shechem, unto the plain of Moreh. And to the plain of what? Moreh. And to the plain of what? Moreh. Stop there. Because when you research and you look at this term, Moreh, we begin to see some significant things here. Let me highlight some things in scripture for you. Because when you research Moreh a little bit, and I put it on your screen here, um, I made a slide. Of it. You look at Moray, you'll see things a little easier. I want you to see this term Moray. Notice it's Strong's number 4176. And we're going to break it down a little bit for you. The Strong's, what it means is, it means teacher. We're going to show you that. It means teacher. It means a teacher. You can see Strong's 4175, that it means teacher. More in Hebrew means teacher. So it literally is a oak tree. When we go back to the scriptures, it was the oak tree at Sikkim, according to the scriptures. Like we were reading when Abraham stopped and he first indicated when he was close to the mountains, more to one just read it, which were huge points. These places are huge points, points when I teach Hebrew scriptures in terms of biblical geography, because it's huge things happen in between Gideon and, 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 and when uh, Abraham to Moses himself, there are some significant things that happen in that particular territory. You'll get it momentarily. This is really even goes through Joshua, even to the uh, ironic altar. And this is something that's very big when you begin to look at and study the scriptures as we all to see them. So when we get into this a little bit deeper, we discover that what this is all about, that it is the tree of Moray. What is the tree of Moray? What it have to do with ancient Israel? Because ancient Israel, the tree of, or the oak of Moray is significant. Because from the perspective, even when we look at today, um, we will see it, or in ancient times, rather, it is a tree that's uh, 2,000 and 3,000 years old. Even our ancestors still do that in Africa today. That's how you know we're the people of the book. Ashkenazi Jews don't reverence trees like that. They don't venerate trees like that. 
is always of the African tribes who go by the tree. And this tree is the oak of Sikkim. It is called the Moray tree. So this was a old, very old tree. It was very large, it was huge. And they would go there to, to elaborate, to talk, to have discussions, right? On these very old trees. And some of the times we see it in movies today, where we see that people go to trees and they have the spiritual meanings and and take them back and it's conversations there and some people who operate and familiar spirits go there to connect with spirits, whether we're talking about in Shintoism in Japan or in Africa, or we see it in various movies, Disney movies, all that crazy mess um, that don't let your children watch that. But you can see the significance of even how, how Satan brings about divination. Because this is why the Bible says that the people are trees. When we go to Ezekiel chapter 31, I think we went a couple of weeks and we talked about that, um, Ezekiel 37, it always denote people as oak trees or we are some type that, or Seder trees. We are always in representation of trees. In fact, the Mashiach said that, hey, um, I, I am divine and uh, you are the branches. We are always classified biblically in a very metaphoric way as trees. So these are these ancient giant trees that they will go to, right? Sounds crazy, right? Sounds like something supernatural, something spooky, but it has deep, deep significance because the reality is, is that this was a great place to meet. It had a huge shade and teachers would go there to meet and underneath that tree and people will go there even make their pilgrimages. They will make a pilgrimage journey to meet the teacher and to learn there. That's why they were called the moray trees because mores would go there to teach because they didn't have internet back then, folks. You didn't have a copy of the Torah readily on you. You can just go read what the prophets said. You can just go read about um, what the Moses, the writings of Moses. You can just go read those. So they had to go by a moray tree and sit under the tree. So they will look at some of these teachers and they will go and submit themselves to the plethora of information that all these mores had and the knowledge they had and they will teach the people. This was an awesome place to meet. It was the tree of Sikkim. It was the more tree. It allowed people to come and go and they would meet teachers and it was a lot of wisdom that being shared there. And this is what it is, it's the oak of Moray or the oak of the teachers is the oak of the teacher. And that's why this is going to make a lot of sense momentarily. Now notice we go to 4175 because that's what 4176 says. It has the same meaning as 4175. Same one, right? It's the same one. 4176 Moray, but it also says 4175. B, 4175B, you'll see they both mean more. But look at the difference between the two. Because it also means rain. Go back to 4176. It also means rain. It means rain. When you look into it, it means rain. To the next one. It means a rain. When you look at that, you will find that that word is rain. I think it was cut off a little bit at the bottom there, but it means rain. So if you look at 4175, you will find that it also means rain. Wait a minute, we just got through talking about water with Abraham. This here means rain, but it means the former rain or teacher. They both are synonymous with one another. This is why I love Hebrew so much because it goes beyond the Greco-Roman, Americanized, Grecianized, Germanic English, which is flat. These words are important because um, it wraps all kinds of concepts around it. So that when you really begin to look at what this means, when I say teacher, many of y'all think teacher of what, what I'm doing now. Oh, he's just teaching or, like, or professors who teach. 
But this is in a different light. This is from a different perspective. Because in ancient Hebrew, the concept of teacher had far much more deeper meaning than someone just giving you information. And nothing is wrong with that. But it has a deeper understanding. A teacher is always connected to the former reign. Teachers are always connected to the former reign. Now, for those who are not familiar, of course, with agricultural cycles in Hebrew, and that's why the scripture is an agricultural book. Sowing and reaping, breaking up the fallow ground, seed, harm, seed time, harvest time. It is an agricultural book. So agricultural cycles were found in Israel. And there were two reigns that happened in Israel. There's a former reign and there's a what? Latter reign. There's a former rain and there is a latter rain. And it comes in the fall during the feast of Sukkot. That's what the latter rain does. Normally around the end of September or October. And it goes all the way through the month of March. The, the fall rain happens in the fall. That's when you, they did a lot of their planting. There's also planting as well. So you don't plant just in the springtime, but you also do it in the latter rain time as well. So as soon as the harvest is in, um, over there, you, you begin now to reap, you begin to teal, teal the ground, you begin to replant, you do it really quickly to beat what? The former rain. So the seed goes into the ground and then the former rain comes and fall. And the former rains are very hard. This is a very hard rain. You ever see rain that just wipe out everything? It, it, it wipes out everything. That's what the former rain does. It comes in the fall and it wipes out everything. But then comes the latter rain. The latter rain is the second season of the year of rain, which happens in the springtime. See, a lot of us have this American mindset and we're just going to really miss it because we think, oh, that's backwards. We, we should say the former rain should be in the spring, and then the latter rain should be in the fall. But the biblical cycle of agriculture in the scriptures always starts in the fall. That's why we have what we call Sukkot, or the Feast of the Tabernacle. So from their perspective, there's multiple year cycles, and you have to have the agricultural year, which starts in the fall, and then it goes from fall to fall. It goes from fall to fall. I'm going to make sense of this momentarily. So, so that's why you have seasons in the fall. And then, of course, you, you reap it in the spring. So you sow it in the fall, and then you reap it in the spring. So that's backwards. Why is the other way around? Why did you sow it in the spring, but then you reap it in the fall? That don't make any sense. But that's where your first fruits and barley come in at. Right? Where you reaped it in the middle of the summer or at Shavuot. In terms of, that's why we raid the sheaves. It is where harvest happens. It's the rest of it get harvest back in the fall again, right before Sukkot. So I get a second harvest. Wow. So it's important for you to see that a teacher is connected to the early and the former rain. That's why moray, let's break this word moray down. Let's see if we can get a spouse understanding. Some of you say, oh, this is all gibberish. I don't understand the prolegomena. I don't understand that. I gotta listen to this 10 times just to make sense of it. All right, let's get the word moray. Moray, we get mem, yod, rish, and hay. Mem, yod, rish, and hay. And so moray in paleo, it means uh, it would mean waters that is connected to the head of Revelation. Wow. That's what it means. More, I want you to look at this water here. More is always associated with the latter and a former rain. Always. And so, again, it means the waters that are connected to the head of Revelation. That's what it means. So, of course, when you add Vav, Vav is a nail that connects the head, which is Rish, and the revelation of the waters that is connected or the waters of the nail of the head of revelation. 
That's more. It's more. So that's why when you think of teacher, who do you think of the ultimate teacher? The Messiah. He's a teacher of all teachers. He's a more of all mores. Because he is the waters of the nail that is the head of revelation. And amazingly, it means teacher. So the greatest teacher is the one who is the one who brings water that connects the head that reveals. Wow. So inside the word more, I want you to see this. Inside the word more, I noticed something very interesting. Inside the word more, you get the word yara. Wait a minute. You get this word yara. Yod, resh, and he. So if you look up yara, what you're going to find, you're going to find Strong's, go to Strong's 3384. Now, for those of us who've been in the Hebrew awakening for quite some time, we know what Yahweh means all automatically. But let's look at Strong's and let's look at this 3384. Let's see what it means. It means to flow as what? Water. Wait a minute. It means to flow as water or rain, to lay, or to throw. I'm going to throw water, especially an arrow, to shoot an arrow, wow. figuratively to point out, as if by aiming a finger to teach an archer, archer to cast, direct, inform, instruct, lay, show, shoot, to teach through. Woo. It literally means, watch this, to throw water. Now you're getting me confused, Dr. Howard. What do you mean to throw water? It means to throw water. So yara means it is the idea of aiming an arrow. Notice we see that in there. To aim a arrow, that's what Torah means or yara means. Now, could somebody tell me in scripture what an aiming of an arrow makes you think of? Any scripture, what do an aiming of arrow makes you think of? When you hear arrow of any concept. Psalms Division 127. You're correct. Watch this. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Woo! What are arrows? Children! So we always say that your children are like what? Arrows. And you're supposed to take them and you're supposed to pull them back. And you're supposed to shoot them. Shoot them where? <laughs> See, Christianity said, oh, you got a lot of man arrows in your quiver. And they have no understanding as to what it means. Because they have no concept of Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, verse 5, verse 6, verse 7. In terms of why we have children, what is the purpose? Where do we shoot these arrows, our children? Where do we shoot them? We shoot them at the enemy, which is the bull's eye. Woo! So when the Bible that said, that's why the scripture says, we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory, all have missed the mark. That's what this word Hebrew or sin means. Sin is the Hebrew word, which literally means to miss the mark. It means to miss the mark. That's the, the Hebrew word for sin, to miss the mark. We have somehow missed the mark. We missed the target. So, um, so that's important. So that's what sin is. Sin is is not being connected to the most high it's sin is transgressing against what torah against yara so that's why sin is connected to yara yara and that's where the sin of course is kata kata means to mr mark 
but Yara is to pull back and to aim and to shoot an arrow at a target. So when you see it in its, in, 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 in what it really means in its simplest form, you understand that you cannot miss your target. Now, we already established, because I want to go somewhere with this, that children are arrows. And so you pull them back, and we already established that we want to use them to aim at the enemy, which is our target, right? But if you miss the mark, you have not, you have sinned before the most high, if you miss the mark. So the greatest thing that we can ever do is raise up a generation of children in Torah that will aim themselves at the heart of the enemy. Woo. How do we know that? Because it's the first and the greatest commandment of all time. You, know, you don't know Torah there. They don't say that. Because you are limited in your scope of Torah. We got to read the Bible from the front of the book. When it says, what was the first commandment ever given? Anybody? What was the first commandment ever given? Be fruitful. That's right. Be fruitful and multiply. This was the first commandment given to Adam and Eve. With the intentions, of course, of them not eating of um, eating from the tree of life, of course. But um, but let's continue, because again, that's the first commandment. You're gonna be fruitful and multiply. So Yara, if we change out the first letter and we put Tav there, which is covenant, you get the word Torah. The very center of the root of Torah is Yara. That's why if you look up Torah. And the scriptures, you're going to get Yara. And what does Tav mean in Paleo Hebrew? It means covenant. So Yara is the, it is the arrow that are shooting of what? Of instructions Woo! of the covenant. Of the instruct. That's what the scripture, all scripture is written by the inspiration of Yah. It is for what? It is for doctrine. It is for reproof. It is for correction. It is for instructions and righteousness. So Yara means, Yara means to the arrow that are shooting is shooting instructions. That's what you do. You shoot instructions. It is the covenant of archery. Wow. It's the covenant of shooting. It's the covenant of throwing of water. Think about it. Yeah, I keep on talking about throwing of water. Man, this man is crazy. Why you keep on talking about throwing water? Because that's what it means. Right? More means to throw water. Inside of more, we get the word Yara, which means Torah. Every more should be teaching Torah. You're not a teacher of the scriptures if you don't teach Torah. Because built within the word teacher is Torah. So if I take water out of my hand and throw it, you know, just throw it at people, that don't make any sense. How much damage can I do to the enemy? Like, like, ooh, I'm scared. These Hebrews are throwing water at me. Ooh, kind of like Catholicism. We're just going <laughs> to sprinkle you with water. They throw in water. Ooh, I'm so afraid. Mafasa, ooh, Mafasa, ooh, Mafasa, ooh. <laughs> These Hebrews are throwing water at me. That makes no more sense. Well, watch this. What kind of arrows? Do the enemy throw? Hmm. It's going to make sense in just a couple more moments. <laughs> if I throw water at you and he got some arrows pointed at me, but what are these arrows made of? Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 16 says what? In addition to all this, Take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Or fiery darts or flaming arrows of the wicked one. So he's throwing, while you're throwing, he's throwing fire, but you're throwing water. Woo. Why? To put out, to extinguish. 
That's what Torah do. It extinguishes the wild of the wicked one. When the Mashiach was confronted with temptation of Hasatan, what did he use? The enemy was throwing his fiery darts of temptation. <laughs> throwing his fiery darts of temptation. And what did the Mashiach say? It is written. He threw his throwing water at him. The water of the word. The water of the word. The word of so when the Bible clearly said that the enemy has fiery, fiery arrows or darts. Woo! These are arrows of fire. So what do you think Yah's arrow is going to be made of? Come on. In order to extinguish the fire, Woo! as we read here in Ephesians chapter 6, it's going to be made of a water. Woo! That's what more means. More means a water thorn. Woo! We throw water, boy. We sling in that water. Why? Because this is a supernatural realm, folks. Hallelujah. And if that's why the Bible speaks metaphorically. Ironically, Torah, Yala, More, all means water. Has water associated, even in Abraham's name, it has water associated Woo! with Miam, associated with, which I'm going to raise up a sea of people, a water of people, a Hebrew people who's going to come into their rightful identity, Woo! who's going to come into their heritable rights, and they are going to throw water at the fiery wilds of the wicked one. So the Torah and More and Yara is all connected. Because it all means the throwing of the water. And isn't this what Torah does? Torah is our arrow of instruction. <laughs> to take the water of the word and the fire. Uh, or to this water of the word and extinguish the fire at the heart of the enemy. Wow. To put them out. That's why we need more more rays. Because more means one who throws water. Woo! It's only when we know the water of the word that we can use this arrow. And we can put out the fiery darts of the enemy. Darts that are firing at you. George Lloyd firing at us. Come on. Amon firing at us. Woo! Degradation firing at us. All types of discriminatory practices, firing at us. All type of injustice, firing at us. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. That's why we need to return back to Torah. Because the only way that we're going to extinguish the plan of the wicked one, the only way that we are going to have the arsenal and the strategies, in fact, spiritual warfare is the word strategy. It means strategy, spiritual warfare strategy. The only strategy we have our water guns. I'm sorry. Thorny water balloons. I'm sorry. Thorny watery darts. It means an arrow, a watery arrow to throw water. Come on. Because where does water come from? It comes from the heavens. Woo! It comes from Shamahim. In fact, Mahi, the, the latter part of the word Shamahim or the suffix of the word means water. That's why the scripture says that there will be a waters above the earth and beneath the earth, on side of the earth. It means water. So Yah says, is water. His water of the word. His water of the word of instructions is designed to be thrown in a specific target in a specific way. And those that are the ones that are throwing them are teachers. They are mores, the one who sit at these trees, these oak trees, these oak of the more, the sycam tree, the sycam tree of the more. When they sit under the tree and they begin to teach for Torah, it drives your enemies away. Come on. When you listen to sound doctrine, not some, some tickle your fancy, um, hyper philosophical, inspirational word. Preach, pastor. You made me feel good. I was down and out, and you made me feel good. But no, those who are teachers of the word, teachers of Torah, line upon line, line precept Woo! upon precept, that is the only thing that's going to extinguish the wiles of the wicked one. The wicked one's flames 
don't go out because you use alliterations. Black preachers always use alliteration. I want to talk about today. I want to talk about reclaim, revival, and recompense. Uh, get your Bible because we are going to go uh, in a word and we are going to somehow we're going to harmonize hermeneutics uh, with relevant homiletics. Can I get a witness? Hallelujah. Uh, can I get a witness uh, in the place? I'm going to use as a thematic thrust as I summon your senses and I invite your intellect. Uh, to look at this passage of scripture, uh, which I'm only going to read one time, and then I'm going to go on the left field and talk about this and talk about that. Um, <laughs> our people are in love with entertainment, philosophical narratives that entertain us, but that doesn't put the enemy's fire out. That's not going to save you with COVID. So thus, Everyone, a lot of people in the church dying. That's not going to save you uh, against the wicked plans and the arsenals of the wicked one. But the ones who can put out the fire, the ones who can put out the flames, the fiery darts of the wicked one are these water throwers. Woo! People who throw water. Water is the Torah of the word. So that's why the Bible says that we all are teachers. When you got Torah, you got Yahweh in you, you got Torah in you. Hallelujah. So, so the role of a teacher takes on a new perspective now. It has a different dynamic. It is imperative that you know the word of Yah, that you know Torah, so you can rightly divide it. It can be rightly divided so that you can, you can put out the fire. You know what water you need to put out the right arrows. Because if you, listen, if you are throwing the wrong thing, the wrong arrows, you're going to miss it. Come on. And you're going to get hit by some darts. That explains the plight of our people. That most of our people don't know the word well wow. enough. And I see this over and over and over and over. Our people do not know the word well enough because Christianity have cheated you out of your destiny, out of your heritable rights, but telling you, you better stay away from that Old Testament. I'm a New Testament believer. When, when I started to say tricks are for kids, but I'm sorry. Um, when you read the New Testament, the New Testament is largely, um, it is a repeat of the Old Testament. It is 70%, it is there's 250 scriptures that are either allusions or they are direct quotes from Torah, from the Old Testament. If the foundation be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? And, and Christianity have, have really cheated people out of their weapons, cheated them out of their arsenal, cheated them out of their war tactic strategies. That's why our people cannot overcome. That's why every nation get very high and we get very low. Why? Because the enemy infiltrate vision and dream and prophetic. I believe we are in the greatest prophetic era of, of the history of mankind. And what happens is the enemy can infiltrate these visions. Christians have visions and dreams and prophetic words. But what happens is, is that, that it, even their own emotional systems, he, he infiltrated them. Why? Why do we do that? Because this is the plan. This is where it all comes in. The enemy takes your vision and your dream, even the word itself, and turn it around and use it for its glory. I've saw that a myriad of times in Christianity. And this is what's happening in the earth realm. Many found, and the prophetic movement is real. It is, it is powerful. But that's why Yah has prophesied it, um, some tremendous things through the Great Awakening. And we're seeing more visions and we're seeing more dreams. And we've seen prophetic miracles and healings, I think, than ever before. And there's truth that's been exposed all over the world. Yah is speaking. But they don't, if you don't have guard, guardrails, if you don't have instructions, you don't have an instruction manual, if you don't have Torah, the enemy will infiltrate. It, he's going to infiltrate every dream, every prophetic decoration you have, and he's going to add to it and take it away, and he's going to do all type of things, and you won't even see it. 
And so the word, according to the Torah, becomes dead in the earth. This has been the history of the Catholic Church and those who are byproducts of Catholicism. If you are Christian, you are a byproduct or by extension of the Catholic Church. Torah has become dead because the enemy has infiltrated. Because you you just you knew how to cherry pick the scriptures, you know how to um, uh, have take out and extrapolate scriptures that apply to you, without looking at the context of the scripture. We have used sound bodies. So Torah is designed to be an arrow, the instruction manual to throw water at the enemy. It's not designed to put you in bondage. It's designed not to drown you. But Torah is designed as a weapon to use as an arsenal against Hasatan and the evil powers that be and the wicked systems of this world. That's why no political establishment will ever save us according to Deuteronomy chapter 28. No restitution will ever help us overcome our economic plight. People are gonna always exploit us economically. No one will save us medically with all of the issues we have in terms of medical and health wise. No medical field can't save us. Political establishment can't save us. The economy can't save us. Any social dynamic, NAACP, nobody will be able to save us. Our only weapons that we have is Torah. It is Torah. And so the word of the living Yah is designed to do what? Refresh us. Israel, you're looking for a refreshment? It is in Torah. Oh, yeah. Torah is the former reigns. What is the former reign? It is the reign that would uh, that you would see um, you would see this huge storm coming. It's, a, it's this first storm that hits about 50 miles per hour that blows you over. You ever see all the wind blowing and it's just a vicious storm? That would explain this first rain or the former rain. That explains what it is. It's this vicious wind that blows you over. Rain that comes in so hard, kind of like a gully washer, if you know what that means. And, and it breaks up everything. It destroys so many things that's in its path that shouldn't be there. This is what happens when you hear the word or the truth for the first time. It rubs you the wrong way, doesn't it? I don't like that because it's not what my denomination taught me. It's not what I learned in Christianity. It's diametrically opposed to everything I've learned. That's the gully washer. That's what, that's what the former rain does. The former rain is a vicious rain. It clears everything in its path. That's the former rain hitting you and breaking you, breaking up things. It's challenging you. It's what the word of Yah is designed to do. If the word uh, comes to you and it makes you feel gooey gooey all the time, you're not reading the same word that I'm reading because it's not designed to make you feel happy all the time. And there is a designation for encouragement. Absolutely there is. But Torah convicts you, it challenges you, it stretches you, it makes you accountable. And that's why, who wants to see yourself messed up? Nobody wants to see yourself messed up. That's what it does. It messes you up. That's what it's designed to do. It's designed to show you your sin. That's why the apostle Paul said, if it had not been for the law, I wouldn't even know what sin is. Sin was my barometer. I would still be in a covetousness situation. I'll still be in maybe fornication, but I know what sin is because of Torah. Torah helps shine the light. It is a messy situation. Nobody likes when water is splashed in their face. That's what Moray is supposed to do. Splash water in your face. <laughs> throw arrow, throw, throw these, just throw water. Nobody likes that. Who likes when water is splashing their face? Nobody. So, oh, no, y'all stop. Stop. Oh, no, stop. Stop. People get angry. 
because water gets in your eyes and it burns. Water get into your eyes and it burns. It's the same way the water of his word is designed to get in your eyes. It's designed to burn out everything that's not like him. That which is not like him, he burns it out. And we rub our eyes, and that's the purpose of it, to get all of the impurities out of you. So we have to make sure that we operate in, in this capacity. Folks, this is a time for us to stop, um, to stop in, in a mode, in a, sin of in a trajectory of sin. We need the water of more rays. More rays is going to send flat-footed and teach Torah and teach the testimony of Yahusha. This is the water of his word. Yah is sending in this season clouds of rain. The drought is over. Yah is now going to send clouds of rain. And I believe that there's going to be, not all Israel is going to be saved, but there's going to be scores that will be that's going to come out of darkness and come into its marvelous light. That's why the former rain is tough. It's tough. It's difficult. Because it requires a change of lifestyle from this drought, weary, thirsty land to this gully washer of the word. And that's why in this season, Yah is raising up more rains and teachers to do what? Plant seeds plant seeds, so that when the latter rain comes, which is prophesied in the scriptures, that he will send his spirit, who's going to resurrect those gifts in the end time. That's what we see in Israel. There are gifts of being resurrected, and people are going to have more dreams and visions. He said, in that latter day, that's what I'm going to do. In that latter rain, I'm going to pour my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters, they're going to dream dreams. They're going to prophesy. And that's what we see in Acts chapter 2. As it's being developed, we see this second reign of Acts in Acts chapter 2. Right before the Messiah comes, we're going to have a spiritual impartation of Torah. It's going to be revealed. And let me tell you, it's not just raids uh, that, that, that beat up on us, that beat up on our land, a rain that beat up on our land, pardon me but it's going to destroy everything that's not like him. That's the definition of Torah. That's what we do. That's the latter rain comes and the Ruach HaKadosh, it mixed with the soil and the seed. And one day, this is what it does. That's why you must have, you must put it in the ground quickly because in one day, growth happens. You'll walk across something, and it looks like a brown field in a parking lot, and you think it was nothing, but the next morning, you will walk out, and there's green sprouts of everything everywhere. We have to more than ever before be in a position to be postured by the Most High Yah, to be in a position to be the water or to throw water, to be more rays of this oak tree that will sit by this oak tree and to throw water, to give you the arsenal so that you can throw and you can defend yourself against the wiles of the wicked one. Nothing puts out fiery darts like arrows of water. Your defense is Torah. Praise Yah. Hallelujah. Any questions? I went longer than what I wanted to. Any questions? Praise Yah. Any questions? What's a moray based on Genesis? Based on what's a moray? Teacher of the law. Teacher. Teacher of the law. What else did it require? When we look at the etymological root of moray.
giving knowledge and truth to those that um, just giving knowledge and truth to those that um, they poured into. Yep, and metaphorically, metaphorically, how do how do they give believers the arsenal to fight the wicked one? First, they have to be led by the Holy Spirit and not counsel of men. And they have to build upon the teaching precept by precept. So everything should line up the Torah. It's supposed to all add together. That's right. That's right. That's right. Inside the word more is what? Yara. Yara means what? Torah. So every teacher should be teaching what? Torah. Torah. That's what make a moray a moray. Those individuals who sit by the oak tree to be a teacher of men. And when he when he teaches, when mores teaches men and women, men and women are now, they are now equipped with the arsenal they need against the fiery darts of the wicked one. And how do we fight? What tools, what arsenal? What weapon the most I've given us? Because again, you don't want us against flesh and blood. This is spiritual warfare. His word. His word. His word. The Torah. And ironically, that's what Torah or Yara means. Latter rain. Former and latter rain. Why is rain being associated with Torah? And that's why the scripture talks about the washing of his word or the water of his word, the washing of the water of his word. Because the word or Torah is water. And so you got to watch and be, pay attention to these idioms and look at how these um, literary form of the scriptures and how it speaks in a very metaphorical sense you're gonna find that the only way, how else are you gonna fight against the enemy? A shield of faith is only you defending yourself, but how else do you, do you fight? What puts out fire? Hallelujah. Water. Water is what puts out fire. So, and the scripture uses arrows purposely. We should be raising up our children to be emphatically to be used, to be thrown at the wicked one, raising up a godly, righteous seed who follow Torah that's going to extinguish the plans of the wicked one. That's why the scripture says you teach Torah to your children when they lie down, when they rise up, when they sit down, when they're out and about. That's why Torah should be in our hand as a sign in our hand and as a sign between the frontness of our eyes, that you are bad. You are a, and that's me bad in a good sense, that you are the enemy's worst nightmare. He don't care if so-called Christians um, receive him as, you know, uh, Yahushua as, as, as Lord and Savior. He don't care about Hikamashiach and running around and you don't about Shia, Ebro, Shada. He don't care about that. He's still going to have his way. But what he's afraid of, it's those who possess Torah, because that's the only that's the only weapon that Yah has given us in order to defeat Hasatan. That's why the scripture says, this is the endurance of the saints. Those who keep the commandments, Torah, and believe in the testimony of Yahushua HaMashiach. Of course, King James Version says, believe in the testimony of Jesus Christ. But that's the only thing that is your weapon, Thank your tool. That's going to defeat Kasatan. That's why he's raging war against who? Not against Christians. According to Revelation chapter 9, Revelation chapter 12, he raged in war against who? Against the commandment keepers. That's what the scripture says emphatically. It's those who keep the commandments. Because he knows you've got a weapon. And we have not properly utilized. In fact, many of us didn't even know we had a weapon. But our weapon, we have arrows, and we shoot these arrows, and we raise up our children 
to shoot arrows at the wicked one, to extinguish, to put out the fiery darts of the wicked one. That's what we do until the Mashiach comes in the final battle to defeat Hasatan. We fight. That's why the weapons of our warfare are not what? Carnal, but they're mighty through what? The Yada putting down of every stronghold. How we pull down strongholds and fight Hasatan is through Torah. And that's why mores are equipped. They should be equipped to give you Torah so that you can use Torah as arrows to put out the fiery flames, according to Ephesians chapter 6, of the wicked one. Hallelujah. And I just wanted to say and encourage, you know, those that are listening, even when we see our Messiah, Yeshua, in the Brick Hadashah and Matthew and the Gospels, when he was tempted of Hasatan, he was at, you know, in the natural, one of the most weakest points because he had been fasting for 40 days and for 40 nights, which means that not only was his physical man at a weak point crying out for strength and for nourishment, but even mentally, you can just imagine if when, when we're fasting, what you go through mentally, your mind sometimes can be so convoluted or the things that you have struck, you know, you have cut yourself from or the things that have been the thing that you would run to. And now that you're fasting, your mind is even looking for some form of, 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 of a remuneration or some form of satisfaction. So just look at where he was from the natural to the mental to the spiritual. So maybe some of us are going through things and, and even what's happening in the world right now, I wanna encourage you through our savior who has become our role model that what did he use each time Hasatan came to bring him an alternative to obedience, <laughs> to bring him an alternative to bring to 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 use the things in the natural to try to bring him to a place of disobedience and even to a place that was taking him away from Yah, away from purpose. What did he use? He used the Torah. He said, "It is written." And each time he was presented something, see, Hasatan just thought, "Oh, I have you now." You're in a broken state. I have you now. You going through all kind of turmoil. I'll have you now. Your body is crying out. You got all of these sicknesses, disease, and infirmities. Oh, I have you now. And things going on in the world, and we don't understand why. And we're saying, Father, where are you? He said, I have you now. What did our Messiah use? He used the arrow. He threw the water. He used the Torah. And he said, it is written <laughs> hallelujah and he had to keep using it over and over and over so not only was he standing in a place of authority hallelujah but he was also standing in a place where he had to remind himself he had to encourage himself so he was standing in authority he was standing as a moray of the law and that word that everyone to be thrown out to dispel everything that Hasatan was trying to get him to bow down to and what happens after all of that then it says that the ministering angels came and ministered back unto him yes. empowered him everything that he emptied on himself he received it and it came right back unto him so i want to encourage you hallelujah i want to encourage our people that as we are remaining in torah walking according to his law statutes and commandments that wherever we are whatever is going on yah has given us his word his torah that we can throw it hallelujah and see the manifestation of that word being released and manifested in every scenario of life hallelujah Hallelujah. Powerful. You're right, Paul. And he hit the mark, right? He hit the mark. Even the apostle Paul said, I press towards the mark 
of the prize of the high calling. And that's what Torah is designed to do. Torah means to make the mark. Could you shoot arrows? You say you shoot arrows against the fiery wilds. What do Hasatan try to get you to do? Not keep Torah. Not keeping Torah is equivalent to sin in your life. It's equivalent to sin. And so how do we come against the wiles of the wicked one? We come against the wiles of the wicked one by using the word. It is written. The only thing that the Mashiach quoted, he didn't quote New Testament. He didn't quote in any epistles. He quoted Torah. He, it is written. It is written. That's how we're going to overcome Hasatan. Right? We overcame him by what? The blood of the Lamb. And the words of our testimony. And the words of our testimony. So we we have to continue to stay um, afloat, continue to stay uh, in Torah, so that we can be this force to be reckoned with. Listen, you there's no one like you. You are the biggest threat to Hasatan. You are you will populate the kingdom and you will plunder hell when you keep Torah. Israel. You, there's no one like you. You're the apple of his eye. You the center and the object of his affection. When you hit Torah, listen, there, I don't care what the predator is. Listen, you switch from being the prey to the predator. You go from being a casualty of war to a barbaric soldier. You go from being victimized to being victorious. When you have the right tools and arsenal, which is the washing of the water of Torah, that's your only defense against Hasatan, because he has fiery arrows or fiery darts. And the scripture says Torah is an arrow, but he also more or Yara means the latter rain. So it's not just this little rain that we just put out as fire, but it's like it's like the, the former rain. It's it's this gully wash. It wipes out everything. And that's why the scripture says that um, when the enemy comes in, when you read in the original Hebrew, like a flood, the spirit or the Ruach of the Most High lift up a standard. We just, in our Germanic languages, we read it differently. We say, oh, when the enemy comes in like a flood, then Yahweh will lift up a standard. No, when you read in the original text, it reads that when the enemy comes in like a flood, the most high lifts up a standard. So standards are rays of water. That's what a flood do. A flood cleans everything in its midst. Floods, anything that, that was that was toxic, is gonna clean it. That's why it's living water. Not just water that stands still and stagnated, because water that stands still begins to stink after a while. But that's why it's moving water, it's living water. So I am the living water. It is living water. What it does, also, when you have a flood, everything goes with the flow. Everything is moving. When you have these typhoons, everything goes with the flow. Everything. It moves buildings, things that, that tend to be unmovable. It moves it. That's what the flood does. So when we come and we praise uh, Judah, when we have Torah Israel, we are the enemy's worst nightmare because we don't just throw little pebbles of water at them. We come in with a flood. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. Uh, still quite a bit of you are here on Zoom. Any comments before we pray out? Well, it's almost like... Um... Like, like the enemy tried to disarm us by telling us that the that the um, the laws are done away with. Right. That's exactly what it is, Daniel. It's it's a tactic. It's a strategy to disarm us. And clearly, that's what teachers supposed to do. That's what a more is supposed to do. Sit on this oak of Sikkim, this the oak of more to one who gives you the necessary water you need to put out the fiery darts or wiles of the wicked one. Anyone else? Excellent, Daniel.
Anybody fired up? You got your water ready? So next time Hasatan come with depression, you're going to throw some water. Next time he come with the spirit to oppress you, you got arsenal and water. Next time you have all type of issues, spirit of, of rejection and abandonment and isolation, you're going to use your weapons. You got big guns. You're fearfully and wonderfully made by Yah. He's giving you all the tools to be successful, to pour down every stronghold. Because the weapons of your fair, warfare, they're not carnal. Looting, civil unrest, civil disobedience, that's not our style. Despite, as it being said, that civil unrest and looting is the language of the unheard, but we know that we don't fight against flesh and blood. Racism, folks, is a spirit. And we know who's behind that spirit. And it is to wipe out Israel by any means necessary. If they can't wipe us out, they will try to degrade us, to dehumanize us, to use discriminatory practices and legislations against us. But Yah said, I will not allow you to be utterly destroyed. That I have loved you, Israel, with everlasting love. I have given you a weapon, but somehow we allow Christianity to take that weapon away. The weapon is Yara, Torah. It means the latter rain. So when next time you see Christians prophesy about the latter rain is coming, the former rain is coming, using Hebraic jargon to fit a pagan system. Run, Forrest, run. Stay away from those environments because they are, you don't know what they're doing. They're using jargon that's really your, your, your rep weaponry. This is your weapons that you use against Hafsatan. Because when you understand the scripture from agriculturally speaking, it always, what, it's agricultural. Y'all always use agricultural tools for warfare, always. That's why Joel said, um, you know, I'm a part of my spirit on all flesh. And the son and the daughter said, dream dreams and prophesy, but continue to read. Chapter three goes on to talk about, and I want you to take your plowshares and your harvesting tools and make weapons of war with them. Folks, we have tools. We have things to defeat Hasatan. Now, we're always going to be oppressed. We are always going to be in the times of Jacob's trouble. It's going to always, but folks, there are some things we don't just stand back with a shield to be defensive. We fight back because the kingdom of Yah suffered violence and the violent take it by force. We don't sit idly by just to be attacked. When we keep the laws, that's only for those who are lawless. When you're lawless, you succumb to the wiles of the wicked one. But when you walk according to Torah, you are armed and dangerous. You are Hasatan's worst nightmare. Because what did, what did the Mashiach use? As more to want to talk about, did he take out a, a, a weapon and start shooting Hasatan? No, because he understand that, or, or a sword. No, he didn't do that. Why? Because he understood that it is a spiritual issue and you cannot address spiritual issues by carnal and natural means. You must have a weapon whereby you are armed to now attack Hasatan, to take it by force from Hasatan. That's all we can do. There's a constant war that's going on until the Mashiach come, the one who is the Prince of Peace, the Prince of Shalom, to destroy the one. That's why Shalom is Shen, right? Shen, Ba, Lamet, and Mem. Shen is means to destroy, we just saw it, as we saw in Sarah's name. It means shin means to consume, or it means to destroy. Va means connection or attach. Lamet is a, like a staff, or it means authority, it's authority. And then mem means chaos. So when we say shalom, we're saying that there will come someone who is, who will come to consume or destroy 
the person who's attached or the authority that's attached to chaos. And so shalom means one who will come to bring peace. Real peace is only in the absence of chaos. When chaos stops, that's when you have peace. And the Prince of Peace, the Prince of Shalom, Shiloh, when he comes. So until he comes, we are in a constant battle. Scripture says we're like, we are sheep to the slaughter all day long. We are in a constant battle against Hasatan, against demonic magistrates, against the powers that be. That's why Ecclesiastes chapter 10 says the apothecary draws flies. So in ancient Israel days, in ancient times, particularly pre-exilic times, we had apo apothecaries. Apothecaries, they were like pharmacists, ancient pharmacists. So they made perfumes, they made spices, they made oils. One of the oils they made was the olive oil. Olive oil always denotes the anointed. When Yah anointed people, there was olive oil. Uh, when, um, when Aaron uh, was anointed priest, it fell down from his head to the beard, to the skirt, to the floor, right? It's whatever you're consecrating one for a specific assignment. You are anointed for a task. You are anointed to do something with specificity. And the scripture says, watch this, the apothecary draws flies, that the flies might bring about a stench to the ointment, according to Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Now, wait, wait a minute. The apothecary is one who has this oil on them. They're the one who has this anointing on them, this grace on them. They have it on them. But the apothecary, Israel, because you have been anointed, you've been a chosen generation, you've been, you've been singled out and deputized to do a specific work that no other classification of people have done. That's why when we read the scriptures, it says, for Yah gave his only begotten son, well, there were only begotten. Well, wait a minute. That tends to be contrary to the scriptures. How can he be the only begotten son when we're called sons as well? The whole earth is in great travail to wait in the manifestations of the son of Yah. Right? We're called, we call sons as, as well. Or in throughout the scriptures, um, Ephraim is my firstborn son. Then, of course, it said Israel is my firstborn son. Uh, uh, demonic, I'm sorry, um, Fallen angels are called sons of God as well. So who is it? If he's the only son of God, why are there other sons? Well, you'll understand what that word, the Greek word, only begotten mean. Um, as we went over that, you all know that. I won't spare, I'll spare you the time. But it means the only one in a specific, with a specific assignment. So he was the only one with a specific assignment. That's why he's called the only begotten. He's the only one within that specific classification. He's the only one. Like I have, I have two sons. But if I give Caleb a specific task, he will be my only begotten son to do that specific assignment. That's the Greek word there. I mean, one who's in a specific group. Wait a minute. We are being given a specific task. That's why Hasatan is raising war against these people. In Revelation, because they are keeping the commandments. They're keeping Torah. And the scripture says they draw flies. Greek word for fly is Beelzebub or Beelzebub. Beelzebub means the Lord of the flies. It denotes demonic activity. That's why the Mashiach said, can Beelzebub cast out Beelzebub? Beelzebub? It means the Lord of the fly. Watch this. That means uniquely because you have been given a specific task. You've been anointed. You are this apothecary to do what nobody else can do. The Lord of the flies or the Elzebub come to bring about a stench of the ointment that you have, Israel. You are special people unto him. You are called by his name. And Hasatan is strategic by trying to send the flies or demonic magistrates, demonic activity to frustrate your purpose, to bring a stench, because he's an accuser of the brethren, to bring a stench about the ointment that you have. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise Yah. All right. 
Dr. Howard, yes, quickly. Is tomorrow a high Sabbath? Uh, no, nope. Tomorrow is not a high Sabbath. Oh, okay, thanks. No. No. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Are you talking about Shavuot? Yes. Yeah, typically, yes, because it's back to back. I'm sorry. I'm reading some okay. of your comments. I'm sorry. Yes. You all have some interesting comments in here. Yes, yes, it will be um, considered a high Sabbath. That's correct. Interesting. Anyone put any questions in the comment? Uh, need to shoot. Beautiful instrument. Okay. okay no, no questions there. But yes, whenever we do Sabbaths back to back, it will be considered um, high Sabbaths. That's correct which means that you don't do any servile work, you don't uh, do any other uh, your own pleasures uh, in that sense that is considered a high Sabbath, that's correct. That is correct. Or anyone else? Praise God. All right, I'm going to uh, end our session on social media and then uh, we have pray out as a as an assembly and give some important announcements um, as it relates to to that. Praise Yah. Thank you.